Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. And alhamdulillahi na'hmaduhu wa nasta'inuhu wa nasta'gfiruhu wa na'udhu billahi min shurur yankusina wa min sayyiyati amalina min yahdihillahu falamu billahu wa min yudlil falaha liyalahu wa ashadu an la ilaha inna allahu wa ahtahu la sharika lah wa ashadu anna muhammadin abduhu wa rasuluhu صلواته الله وسلامه عليه أما بعض فإن خير الكلام كلام الله وخير الهدى هدى رسول الله صلى الله عليه وسلم وشر الأمور محدثاتها وكل محدثة بدعة وكل بدعة ضلال وكل ضلالة في النار. This lecture is called there is no compulsion in the in the deen which comes from a number of ayat of the Quran, like the statement of Allah Ta'ala, La ikraha fi deen, qad tabayyin al-rushtu min al ghayb There is no compulsion in the religion. The truth, the truth is clear from the falsehood. So the Muslim doesn't have the right to force people to believe in Islam. It is a, a lie that people push and project when they say that Al-Islam spread by the sword, meaning that the Prophet وسلم, forced people to become Muslims. There are just too many examples in his Sira Mu'attara where people deserve to be killed for some indiscretion or from something that they did against the Nabi himself, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, and he would let him go. Not to mention him walking around forcing people to become a Muslim. La ikraha fi deen, that ayat, there's no compulsion in religion, also means to show you how detestful it, 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 it is to force people. The ayat also applies to the Muslim man who's married to a Jewish lady or a Christian lady. A Jewish lady or a Christian lady that fits the description of those al kitab women who can be married. Wala mutakhiri al ahdan that they're not doing that thing. But even if they believe that Isa ibn Maryam is the son of Allah, and they put a Christmas tree in their house, and they eat pork, and they eat, drink khamar, akramakum Allah, the Muslim husband can't force that to become Muslim. What the Muslim husband is to do is allowed to discuss with them, to say, hey, I don't want a Christmas tree in my house. I don't want my children eating pork. But to compel that lady to leave her religion and come to Islam, La ikraha for deen. Allah asked the Prophet وسلم, a rhetorical question. Afa'anta tukrihu nas hatta yakunu mu'mineen? That's what Allah said to the Nabi. Ya Muhammad, are you going to force the people till they become believers? Not your job. Are you going to give dawah and force the people to become Muslims? Not your job. His job, his responsibility is to explain the risala with wudur, make it very clear, and allow people to accept or to reject based upon the understanding. But if they fought against Islam, then there's a price to pay. There's another way that they're dealt with. But in terms of compulsion, there's no compulsion in religion. And that is a delil of many things. Allah's mercy, which his names and attributes encompass, he is ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. So because he's ar-Rahman ar-Rahim, he doesn't compel people to do things that they... He doesn't want people to be forced. He wants, subhanahu wa ta'ala, people to do things based upon conviction. He's al-Latif, subhanahu wa ta'ala, al-Halim. He is al-Afu, and he loves al-Afu. He loves to pardon. He doesn't give people a break when they deserve to be punished. As Allah mentioned in ayat upon ayat of the Qur'an, وَلَوْ يُؤَاخِذُ اللَّهُ النَّاسِ بِمَا كَسَبُوا مَا تَرَكَ عَلَيْهَا مِنْ دَابَّةٍ وَلَاكِ يُؤَاخِرُهُ مِنَ أَجْنَ الْمُسَلَّةٍ If Allah were to hold everybody responsible for what they've done or what they didn't do, everybody here, without any exception. If Allah were to hold everybody responsible for what they've done, He won't leave a single person on the face of the earth. Not one. And this is one of the reasons that we shouldn't have a hulu and go overboard in people around us. Even if we see someone who we believe, 
is a righteous person, we believe that about him and we say, Wallahu a'la, Wallahu hasibuhu. Because this ayat doesn't tell a lie here. And it's not just this one ayat, there are other ayat exactly mentioning the same thing, like this ayat. So that's the delil that Allah Ta'ala is halim, he's latif. He doesn't make things difficult on people. And then if people find a situation where things do become difficult on them, this condition, Allah increases his rahmah upon them. So the religion of Islam, the khwani, has been made easy. Ayat upon ayat from the Quran. Yuridu Allah bikum al yusr wala yuridu bikum al usr. Allah wants ease for everybody here. He doesn't want to make things difficult upon you. Yuridu Allah an yukhafif ankum wa khuliqa al insan dhaifa. Allah wants to lighten your burden. Whatever you're dealing with, He wants to lighten your burden. Verily, mankind was created difficult in difficulty. In Surah Al Hajj, in Hajj is jihad for the woman, for the old, for the weak. Hajj is difficult. Allah is difficult. It's not easy. But it's difficult from the angle of you have to make a lot of exertion. But it's not difficult from the angel, angle of legislation. So Allah Ta'ala mentioned in Surah Al Hajj, in Surah Al Hajj, Ma ja'ala alaykum fi dini min haraj, min latabikum Ibrahim. Allah has not made things difficult on you in your religion. This is the religion of your father Ibrahim. And that's in Surah Al Hajj, Allah, Hajj is difficult. What do you mean? The meaning is difficult. It's difficult if you're going to walk a lot. It's difficult if you're going to be out there in that heat. It's difficult if you're going to be tired by the time you finish Shabbat. You're going to be tired. But it's not difficult where it's impossible to do things. It's not difficult where if you don't have the ability to do the things you're supposed to do, Allah has come with concessions. And that's the whole deen. He hasn't made things difficult in the, in the deen. He says, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, about this deen, inna hadha deen yusrum, wa lan yashad deen ahadun illa ghalaba. This religion of Islam is easy. And no one tries to go overboard on himself, rough and tough, except the deen will overwhelm him. Because there's too many things to do. One of the intelligent companions, and they used to ask intelligent questions, not questions like ilmul kalam. You don't have one situation, one ayah, one hadith, one sabab and nazul, not one or a fraction of one, where something was mentioned about Allah's names and his attributes, and then one of the companions say, Ya Rasulullah, how did Allah come down? How was his rahmah? How was his hands? How, not one, not one, not one. But you ask them, you find them always asking questions for further elaboration. That's why their way is the best way. It's the ahkam, it's the most wise, it's the aslam, it's the safe, it's the best way. Fatima, radiallahu anha, along with her husband, Ali, may Allah be pleased with both of them, invited the Nabi. He came, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, to the house. First, he invited a man, and then Fatima said, why don't we invite my father, the Nabi, as well? And he said, okay. He invited him. The Nabi came. When he was going into the house, he went to open up the door, but he saw inside of the house, it was extravagant in the way they beautified the house. Fatima and Ali were poor. It wasn't extravagant like our houses. They barely had any money. But when the Prophet was about to go, he saw it, and he stopped and went back the other way. The companions didn't let things like that go by. Fatima said, Ya Ali, go and see what, what happened. Why didn't he come in? They would ask questions like that. Allah's names and attributes never, not once, not half of a hadith, not one incident. Ali went, Ya Rasulullah, you came, we invited you, and you went, why did you go? He told him, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, no, laysa li wala li ayy nabiyyin. It's not permissible for me, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, or any Nabi, to go into a house that is extravagantly decorated. And you can rest assured, it wasn't like our decoration. But the point is, they asked a question. They used to always ask questions about the deen, to learn more. The man came into this direction in the door. Ya Rasulullah, can I fast? and kiss my wife when I'm fasting. He said, yes, 
Another man came in, can I kiss my wife on He said, yes. And then the companion said, well, he said, no, two different answers. They asked questions about that. Why did you say this you know, all the time? To learn their religion. But when it came to Allah's names and attributes, they didn't do it. So the point here is concerning this religion. From Allah's attributes, his names, his qualities, he doesn't make things difficult on people. And this religion is a religion that doesn't want to make things hard on you. None of us, any of us. The older the poor people get concessions. Younger people, they get concessions. People who are sick, they get concessions. People who are traveling, they get concessions. Throughout the deen, the whole deen. So for those of us who are giving dawah, and we're calling people to Islam, and that should be all of us, to show the ease of the deen when he used to teach and send people to give dawah a lot. He didn't send the ignorant people the ignorant man will make things difficult on you. He wants to go to Syria to blow people up. That's what he understands. Because he's young, he's ignorant, he doesn't have knowledge. He or she, they're moving based upon desires. So he would tell them, Bashiru wala tu nafiru, yassiru wala tu asiru. When you go and give these people dawah, make it where you give them glad tidings, Bushra, Bashiru, and don't run them away. Make things easy and don't make things difficult. So what's the talk about today? It's critical talk, actually. Talk is to some of the people, especially our youngsters, but not just them. Due to lack of knowledge and ignorance, we find ourselves in situations we don't know how to navigate. This talk is about people who find themselves in situations where they're compelled. And there's not a single person sitting here except he's compelled to do something that's haram in this religion, without any exception, and Allah knows best. But if I was a better man and I'm not, everybody here is doing something that is against this deen. But we're compelled, so what do we do? I gotta have a bank account that Reba touches it. I work for the masjid, and the masjid sends my money, direct debit to the bank, to my account. It's gonna, it's gonna hit, money is gonna hit Reba. What I'm gonna do? I'm gonna save my money and put it in the in the in the glove compartment in the car, put it in the boot, because there are pictures on the money, and the malaika don't go into the houses where there are pictures. So what I'm gonna do? Leave my money in the glove compartment, so the malaika will come into my house. There are people who do things like that, or he's a youngster and he made toba to lies with each other. Last week, last year. He or she is in the third year of the university, fourth and final year of the university. And they start practicing when they weren't practicing, they become a Muslim. And they say, well, you know, Allah mentioned in the Quran, for an example, tell the believing men to lower their gazes and to be chaste and protect their private parts. So the young man is in the university in the class, he says, I can't really study because I have to look at the teacher. She's a female. So he drops out of the university. And his mother and father may not be practicing. He doesn't have dean. He's practicing now. He drops out of the university. And the mother and father said, what's, what's wrong with you? You only have one more year to go, half of a year to go. Are you crazy? Did you lose your mind? She doesn't go to university anymore because there's ikhtilat. They have to do some kind, of a, some kind of a project, and the girl gets teamed with three boys, and it's just her, and she can't get out of it. Am I saying that's nice? Am I saying that I want that for your daughter? I want that for my daughter? La wallahi, but what, do, what does she do? Does she quit the university in the fourth year? Someone from our community is really against Reba, because Reba is a Kabira from the Quebec. And he never made it his business to go out and to get a house on Reba. He never did that, but his father did. His father did that 30, 40 years ago. And now his father died, and his father has one more year to pay off that mortgage. Just one more year. Do we say, him, sell, sell that house, man? Sell that house. Or do we say, I, I think you should just go ahead and pay that last year off and then own that property? Because it wasn't you who brought, what does he do? The point here is, I'm not telling you to do this or that. 
I'm telling you, we find ourselves in situations like that. The more knowledge you have about this religion, the more understand, the easier you're able to navigate correctly. Not the haram way. I go into a court of law. The companions used to love the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam as Abdullah ibn, Mas Abdullah ibn Abbas said, Kana an Nabiyu sallallahu alayhi wa sallam ahabu nas ilayna wa kunna la naqumu lahu. We used to love him more than anybody. But when he came in, we didn't stand up to greet him. Because we knew how he hated that. He didn't do that. Standing up to greet people out of respect is an action of the kuffar, not the action of the Muslims. It's against the sunnah that the Prophet brought. Sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. I don't want you to miss the point here. He wouldn't stand up for anybody. That wasn't the way he respected people. He respected people in other ways. And he used to say, Sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, and ahabba, and yaqum lahu imtithalim, or, and yatamathal lahu qiyaman, fal yatabawwa maqatuhu min al -nar. Anyone who expects people to stand up, he doesn't like it if they let him prepare his place in the hellfire. He didn't like it. It's not from our religions. Well, Christians, Jews, Europeans, Kofar do, and it's become a norm for us. Now, if we were in a masjid like this, we would fight that. We wouldn't do that in this masjid. We'll look at the issue, and we wouldn't do it. But we have to be careful how we apply that out there. I'm in a court of law in America, and the judge comes in, and the guy at the thing, the cleric hits the thing and says, all rise, and I just sit down. They say, Mr. Abu, <laughs> your honor has just walked in, Mr. Abu, why you didn't stand up? Man, I wouldn't stand up. Prophet Muhammad, we didn't do that. We don't do that to our ulama. Already, Mr. Abu, you came through the door, you're black, that's one strike against you. You're a Muslim, two strikes against you. They didn't even hear my case yet. The jury of my peers, these white people in Manchester, they didn't even hear my case. Am I guilty, not guilty? But as soon as it, one strike, uh, he's Muslim, two strikes, all rise, we don't stand up for the kuffar. Before they hear my case, they're going to say, throw him under the jail. And they didn't even hear my case. So now as a Muslim, do I stand up for that judge or not? Because I am seriously afraid with my iman, with my tawakkul, with my khawf of Allah, I'm afraid. These people not on my side. The judge not on my side. They don't have to get me. I really believe that. Well, that's something you're going to have to determine. You're going to have to acknowledge about what you're dealing with because it's going to happen. It's going to continue to happen. So don't be that extreme Muslim who goes either way. He takes decisions that are knee-jerk and he causes problems for himself for his family, for the ummah, for the community, even the kuffar, be in the middle. And, and there are extremes from both sides. There's a guy who goes to get an interview from amongst us, and he hasn't worked since COVID, and he's really struggling, and he took a lot of debt from people, so he's drowning in debt, and he wants to work to get the money back. So he goes to a job interview now. He goes tomorrow, Monday, job interview, and he wants that job. So when he goes and he finds a woman going to interview him, and she goes to shake his hand. He just shake his hand and say, Abu Sama said, do it. I never told you to do that. I never told you to shake her hand or to hug her and kiss her, to greet her. I never told you that. I said, you will find yourself in these situations. What are you going to do? What does the religion say about it? So that's what we want to deal with. We want to encourage all of you to understand when it comes to issues like this, if you find difficulty determining your reality of your situation, beware, beware, beware of determining that on your own. You more than anybody else have a responsibility to come to the conclusion of what the reality is. I'm not gonna say you ask a chef, and the chef's gonna tell you what's your threshold of pain. Chef is Ramadan, I'm, I'm fasting, but I have a molar tooth that's coming out, I have a toothache. Uh, can I break my fast? The chef said, no. Every time I get a molar tooth, I'm fasting. You should, no, chef, you can't put that on me. Each human being knows his situation better than anyone else. You can't tell me how much pain I'm going through.
You can't tell me how much I love someone I don't love someone. Can you imagine? Can you imagine? For those of you who are married, someone tells you, Wallahi, you love your children from the other wife than you do from this wife. You love your oldest child. And it's not like that. You know who you love the most, but someone's going to tell you, Wallahi, you know what i Get out of here with that. So you definitely have the lion's share of what's your condition and helping to determine it. But when you don't know, you have to bring in people who know, people of knowledge, people of the hustles, people that's their specialty, and it can help you. But don't be of the ones, and this is what we came to talk about today, who are judgmental about Muslims when they're being forced and compelled. Like sister from our community who accepted al-Islam a few weeks ago, she doesn't wear hijab outside of that masjid. She comes to our masjid and puts hijab on inside the masjid by the sisters. When she leaves that masjid, she takes that hijab off. You see her in the street on the bus, and you know she's a Muslim, and you frown at her and say to her, eh, what are you doing? Hey, don't do that. You don't know that lady's reality. The adawa of her mother. He used to be brewery, Hazen Nazar. I mean, Hazen Nazar. And his family, they were Mulvi Sabs all of their lives. That's all they know. And here this boy comes to the sunnah, and he goes to their janazas. He goes and prays with them. He goes to their nikah. He does all of that. And you say, hey, people of the sunnah, they don't sit with, give salams, eat the food of, invite people of innovation. You, have, you say, hey, brother, don't treat him like that. You don't know his reality. He has to be surrounded with people who are mature and have some basic knowledge. And they have social skills. And they know how to weigh the benefits against the harms and the evils. So don't be like that judgmental person going to look at other people. Let me share these incidents with you, and there's quite a few. But we'll share four or five with you, uh, according to the time. You know the dietary law of Islam is very precise, unlike anything else, like Judaism. Judaism is a tough religion. It is tough. And it's mentioned in the Quran how it's tough. But... When they slaughter their food, they have to bring a special rabbi. He has to have special knives. They have to bring special plates. They have to say special dua. It's a whole hoop to do just to eat the food. All we have to do is say, Bismillah, Akbar. That's it. We eat it. Meat. It's one of the ni'mas of Al Islam, the gentleness of Allah. But I want to draw your attention to an ayat of the Quran and an incident of being forced connected to this. And it gets increasingly worse. Allah is what mentioned in the Quran. Pay attention to the ayah. Hurrimat alaykum al mayta tu wa damu. Wa lahmu al khinziri wa ma uhilla li ghayri allahi bihi. Wa al munchanika. Wa al mawkuda. Wa al mutaraddia. Wa al natiha. Wa ma akala sabu illa ma zaykum illa ma zakaytum. Wa ma zubiha ala nusub. Wa an tastaqsimu bil azlam. Thalikum fis. Pay attention to the ayah. May haram for you to eat a Muhammad and Muslims is meat that is dead, dead carry on, is haram. You can't eat meat that has blood in it, and you can't eat the flesh of khinzir. That's the ayah of the Quran. So when the Prophet used to pray, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, qiyam al-layl, al-fajr, maghrib, isha, salat al-istisqa, and he would read out loud, and any time he read this ayat, the word khinzir is in the Qur'an. When I moved to Keithley, and I was new with the Miyapuri Asian community there, I'm just sharing something with you. Every time I would teach the kids, and we would say something in the word pig, a khinzir came up, they would do like this. I was, I noticed it, but I didn't know, I, 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 it took me a long time to catch on. I asked them, hey, why you guys do this all the time? They know it's bad luck, say pig. When you do this, it's good luck. So I asked the question, well, when the prophet used to read, Hurrimat alaykum al to wa damu wa lahm al khinzir, did he do like that? They said, we don't know. I said, that's the issue, you don't know. If it was some good in this stuff, you would have a delil for it, asking questions about Allah's names and attributes this khurafat, if we would have had something there to tell us, do this. Same, similar thing. 
I really didn't deal with Asians when I came into Islam. I dealt with African Americans who didn't know anything about Islam. They didn't know their ankle bones from their elbows. That imam would get on that member and he would talk. You know, I can't even use the word here. I can't even use the word. It was as if he felt as long as his mouth was moving, he's going to use in the khutbah and you're sitting there, ignorant. But then when I did start meeting the Asians, and I went to the masjid, and I saw the mu'adhan say, wa ashhadu anna Muhammad rasulullah and people were doing like that. And I asked the question, where did that come from? They say, well, if you do that, you won't go blind. But the Prophet's mu'adhan was blind, radiallahu anhu, and he's making the adhan. Why didn't that prevent him from becoming blind? It's khurafat. Khurafat. Our religion is not like that. And anytime you find Muslims behaving like that, you have to know distinctively something is wrong. If we're fighting all the time, something is wrong the way things are. So the ayah said, it's haram for you to eat meat, to eat meat that's dead, to eat meat that has blood in it, to, be, to eat the meat from a khanzir, or to meet, eat meat that was slaughtered for other than Allah, or to eat meat that fell from a high place, meat that was strangled and it died from strangling, meat that was gored by another animal, or meat that wild animals ate him, unless you can kill him before he totally dies. He's on the verge of dying. He was eaten by a lion, a tiger, wild dogs. He's about to die. You came and he was still moving. You said, Bismillah, Lord, you can eat that. But if he dies, after being eaten by what? You can't eat that animal. And you can't eat the animal that was slaughtered on behalf on the altar that Kufa used to believe in. Listen to the ayah. Allah said, all of that is fist. You're faster if you eat that. Then the ayah went on, and this is the point. At the end of, Allah, of the ayah, Allah Ta'ala mentioned, فَمِنِ الطُرَّ فِي مَخْمَسَةٍ غَيْرِ مُتَجَانِفٍ لِإِثَمْ but if anyone is forced or compelled to eat any of that, Allah is ghafur rahim. Remember those two characteristics. I'm going to say it, you say it. Whoever is forced to eat any of those that were mentioned, the pig, the this, the that, the that, and he's compelled, and he doesn't do it out of desires, he's compelled. If he's compelled, Allah is Ghafur Rahim. I say you say it. Ghafur Rahim. What's Ghafur? He doesn't have, he don't hold you to a responsible. You don't, he doesn't hold you responsible. He forgives you for what you're doing. Rahim, a lot of Rahmah for you. And you ate a cat and a rat. Terrible. So now, I just came from a restaurant over there on that street in Manchester, where all those restaurants were. And I passed by the restaurant called Sunam. A bass and eight in a restaurant called J90. I had lamb chops and french fries. So while I'm in there, I'm eating it with people uh, on the TV. The situation in, 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 in Syria is on the TV. What's going on in Syria? Because of the war, they've been reduced to eating cats, dogs, rats, whatever they can find. They normally wouldn't eat a cat, a dog, or a rat. Normally, they wouldn't think about that. It's an abomination, it's nasty. But they're in Syria. I've seen Syrian kids eat grass in Syria. We don't know what that reality is. So I'm, I'm, I'm eating in Jaylani's and then a guy is eating the cat or a rat and he's talking about it in the interview. And I say to the people sitting, oh, what is he crazy? What kind of religion is that? Allah says he's a fasher. That he confessed, the ayah said. You eat any of that first if you do it under normal circumstances. But this man whose family is starving in the winter or before the winter comes, he doesn't care about that. He's going to eat a rat. And Allah is ghafur rahim. Wallahi. Because Allah wants us to see another day. As long as you're on this side of the earth, you have a chance, inshallah. That's why it's not permissible to commit suicide. It's not permissible to give up. As long as you're on this, type of, on this side of the earth, you got a chance. You kill yourself, you get killed, you in trouble. 
You're in trouble. He said, خَيْرُكُمْ مَنْ تَالَ عَمَرُهُ مَنْ تَالَ عُمْرُهُ وَحَسُمْ عَمَرُهُ The best person here is the one who lived a long time and he did good deeds. That sheikh in our community who's 75, 80 years old, he performed five hajj, three hajj. He fasted 60 times, 60 Ramadan, 65. And he the revert, he fasted one or two. Or the brother who made Toba, he fasted, you know, he grew up not practicing, he fasted two, three, four hajjs. And he's gonna treat that old man in a disrespectful way? No, Islam wants us to live long. Now that's the example of eating something haram. When you're four, it gets worse than that in the examples. Worse, it, can it be an example worse than that? Yes. To leave no doubt in the mind of the intelligent Muslim, if you're forced to do something, Allah makes things easier for you. In al Jahiliya, the Arabs are just like people today, in that they're Beni Adam. And Beni Adam, as he said in the Quran, when you know who human beings love money every culture every country every era black white arab is that's how it is so in jahiliya they used to hustle and grind and graft like people right now some people didn't care how they made money they make money by highway robbing they'll invite you come to my tent for lunch tomorrow along with your three sons and bring your cousins if you want going to slaughter an animal. When he comes, me and my sons, my brothers, we tie him up and slave him into slavery. Just like that. Free man today, tomorrow you a slave. And you get sold off. And that's a major sin in Islam. They had the institution of slavery. That Islam sanctioned. And the Prophet had slaves. Sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. But he made it haram for a man to sell a free man. And they used to do that, left, right, and center. To make money. They sold Khamar, they gambled, they wrestled, they gambled, they raced, they gambled, they had riba. Anything you could think of. Arabs did it. They sold fake things, get money, counterfeit, fraud. They did a lot. But one of the things they used to do is they used to force their women to do prostitution, Allah. Which women? Not their wives. They used to force their slave girls to do prostitution and to make money. Some of those slave girls became Muslims. And the slave girl in Islam, she's a, she's a Muslim. She doesn't have to wear hijab. She doesn't have to wear hijab. She can be 20, 25 years old. And that's how the companions used to look at a woman who did not wear hijab. They didn't say she was a Catholic. They said she's from the Bedouins, she's a new Muslim, or she's a slave lady, or she's from the Kawaii men in Misa. Those old ladies, 90, 90, 500, they don't need to eat yeah. As for your sister, my sister, your wife, my wife, your auntie, my aunt, like, not wearing hijab. So she's a slave girl. Look what you, they used to do. Some of the masters of those ladies and owner of those ladies, they were munafiqun, kuffar, munafiqs, acting as they were Muslims, like the main munafiq. Abdullah ibn Ubay ibn Sulul, the troublemaker. He made trouble throughout the Dawah of the Prophet's life in Medina. A big troublemaker. So what happened? He had a lot of slave girls. He used to make those go go get that money. What the slave girl gonna do? Go to Prophet Muhammad? Sallallahu alayhi wa sallam? She's gonna go to who? She accepted Islam and she has nobody but Allah. And the master says, go make that money. And she has a choice between going to make that money and getting her head chopped off. Yeah, Akhi, don't let your mind travel far away to Rasulullah and the slave girls. Right now in Lebanon, go to Lebanon to help the Syrian refugees. There are refugee Muslim women from Syria who lost their husbands. They have three, four, five daughters. They do the same thing with the Lebanese soldiers. To live to see another day. This is real by the Lord of the Kaaba, Allah. So in my own eyes. In Kenya, Somali refugees. This is the reality. So I hear about that. You get news about that. She did that. I will be that. Don't, don't, don't judge her like that. 
Prophet talked about the hadith of the three people, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, who were locked in the cave. The rock went over the cave, and the three men in the cave, each one mentioned and made a tawassal of the deed. What's the tawassal? The tawassal is when you go and you ask Rasulullah, help me to get pregnant. Ask the dead person, help me to do this. Help me pass it. That's kufum billah, shirkum billah. The Muslim shouldn't do that. But asking Allah, Allah, you're the ghani, so give to me. You're Rahman, so have Rahma. And you make tawassal by his names, actually, no problem. You ask a nice brother, you're going to, you know, make dua for me. Don't forget me in my dua. I'm going through some anxiety issue. You make dua. His brother, he can do it. He make dua. Oh, you think about the best thing that you've ever done. So these three people mentioned the best thing. I'm only going to mention one here because this is the point. The man said, as for me, I made a dua that I had a cousin, my relative, who was hit by hard times. And she came to me. And she asked me for some money. I said, I'll do it, but you got to do haram. She said, I will be that. And she left. But her condition got worse. I'm not telling you something that's in no comic book or that's on TV. Some of you may even know situations like that. The lady is forced. She came back and said, all right, let's do it. The hadith said, the man said, when I got in the position that a man gets in a position to do that with the lady. That's what the Rasul said. The lady said, Ya Abdullah, taqillah, fi Allah. And do not take the ring off except by the right way. This is not the right way. He got up. He said, you got the money. I'm not doing anything. Allah did that for you. You're sick alone. Open up the door. The point is people in this situation. It's not something imaginary. So Allah revealed an ayah in this. This is the point. First ayah about the fool. This is the second ayah. And it gets worse. Do not force the slave girls into prostitution. That word is in the Quran. Al Bira. The one who does prostitution is a, a, a Raju Baghi or a lady who's Baghiya. Don't force your slave girls into prostitution when it is clear they want to be upright because of Islam. And anyone who forces them to do this crime, Allah is Ghafur Rahim. My question to you is in this case, Allah is Ghafur Rahim to who? To the master who's forcing her or to the girl? What's the answer? To the girl. And she's doing that major crime because Allah is Ghafur Rahim. Allah is Ghafur Rahim. So the young brother, he becomes a Muslim. He doesn't see that Allah is Ghafur Rahim. He doesn't see that on himself or on other people. And then he claims Salafiyah. He claims the Sunnah, Alul Hadith. Well, you more than anyone should know Allah's names and attributes, man. In the Dawah, we don't see Allah's Ghafur Rahim. The Prophet mentioned, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, and Qala Halak al Nas, anyone who says the people are destroyed, society is no good, then he's the one who destroyed them. If you're looking at people and you're looking at people with the Ain al Izdira, you have Su'adhan about everybody. He makes a simple mistake. He drank with his left hand. He did something, made it. We're ready to pounce upon him. His ijtihad is not the same as my ijtihad. His understanding is not the same as mine. And an issue that it is allowed. You can understand why he see it his way. But the way we are is you don't see it my way. And I'm going to ignite the fire of enmity and animosity right here in this masjid. Right here in this masjid. I may hide this year with some people. Because I mean, hide with them. I know about the Brotherhood of Islam. There are a million, billion people there. Where I am, this is the Brotherhood of Islam right here. Since I've been a Muslim. But when you're at Hajj and you're with the 500 people that you're with for two and a half, three weeks, you learn the Brotherhood of Islam. You really learn it. 
because it's up front and personal and it's in your face with people here be live in the message sharing the same spot but it's not like hutch when this one gets hurt and he needs something when you need something and he brought it to you how we all made it from one point and it was just amazing you look at each other and you say, man, I know about the Ahu of Islam. All of those ayat, I know about them. But when you go to Hajj and you do something with people, similar to it is going to, what do you call it, going camping. What do you call that again? Reception. You go camping for a month. Same thing, you get close to people. So what's the point? What's the point? What's the point? The point that I'm trying to make right now is, as it relates to this issue of women like that being forced, being forced. When you know people like that, you're supposed to be easier. In our community like that, we're supposed to be gentle and more easier with each other. You made a mistake, brother. Relax. But when I think that, as Allah established in many ayat, Allah shadidu al-iqab. He said that a number of ayat. Allah is severe and punished. That's all some people know, is that part. So our da'wah is reflective of that. You got to take it easy with people. Bedouin urinated on the mischief floor. And we all heard it. We all know it. That's the gentleness of the legislation of Al-Islam. When you fall into difficulty, the religion wants things easy. Allah wants things easy for you. Combine your prayer. Show your prayer. Don't fast. Allah loves it when you don't fast because you're traveling. Or whatever the case is. The third example is worse than the first two. What could be worse than the first two? What's worse than eating a rat or cat and a pig and a dog? Which one would you guys consider to be worse? The lady doing prostitution or eating a rat? Which one is greater in your opinion? Which one you think? If someone said a dog, that's his point of view. But I would say prostitution. There's one worse than that. Not one example, two, three, four, five. Multiple examples in the Quran teaching us leaving no doubt. If you're forcing, you're compelled, take it easy. Allah wants it easy. And that is what happened during the time of Mecca when it's very difficult to be a Muslim. And in the month of Muharram that just passed, People get close to Allah by cursing the companions. The companions of the Prophet Sallallahu are an integral part of the religion, not just stories of men that inspire us, how they sacrifice, how they, nah. They are part of this religion. You're not a real Muslim if you don't look at them correctly. You know, the real religion of Islam, we're Muslims, and this is the religion of Islam. Inna deen and Islam. The Islam that Allah will accept. Only deen is Islam. What's Islam? Part of that Islam is how do you look at those companions. The deen with Allah is Islam. When Munkad and Nakia come and say, what's your religion? You say, my religion was Islam. My religion is in Islam. How you looked at those companions? How did you look at them companions? So now with those companions, in Mecca, they were very weak. They were very oppressed. Some of them accepted Islam, especially the very first ones. Some of them had people to protect them, but most of them didn't have anybody to protect them. Like the family of Yasir and his wife, Sumeya, who was the first lady who got shahada in El Islam. And the way the Kufar killed her for sport and play and amusement. They used to get drunk and get high and bring companions who were poor, and they'll persecute them. Cut them up, burn them, put sand in their wounds, put heavy rocks on them, and the companions wouldn't apostate. Like Bilal ibn Rabah, who kept just saying, Ahad, Ahad. But, Yasir and his wife got caught along with their son, Ammar. And those kuffar got tired of persecuting them. So they said, let's kill them. They killed the father in front of the son. Killed the mother in front of the son. In a way, 
that I can't even say it here because it won't be appropriate. Prostitution, I'm going to say that because that's in the Quran. Just like I'm responsible as a dad to take my kid on the side to teach them LGBT and not act as if that doesn't exist. I better teach them about those things as opposed to letting them learn that stuff in the street. So they killed her, Radhi Allah and Huma, and said to the son, if you curse Allah and Muhammad, we'll let you go. You just have to curse Allah and really curse Muhammad. And he did. Radhi Allah and he cursed him. He made a shatam and a sub against the Nabi in the Prophet's absence in front of those kuffar. Sallallahu alayhi wa When they lived up to their word, they let him go. He came in Mecca, found the Prophet. He was crying. Rasulullah said, what's the matter? If Rasulullah knew Hazar Nazir, if he was Hazar Nazir, he would ask him, what's the matter? If he knew the ilm al ghayb how, how do we believe in that nonsense? Here's a hadith. If he's Haz and Nazir everywhere, omnipresent, all over, everywhere, why would he ask him? He was there. We become like Christians. Well, he's Haz and Nazir, except if he doesn't want to be. It just doesn't make sense. Allah told him, and us in ayat after ayat, قُلْ لَا يَعْلَمْ مَنْ فِي السَّمَاوَاتِ so he said, what, what's the matter? What's the matter? He said, Ya Rasulullah, those kuffar, they killed my mother. They killed my father right in front of my eyes. They did this, they did that. Ya Rasulullah, they asked me if I cursed you, they would let me go. He said, what did you do? He said, I cursed you. Rasulullah said, how is your heart when you did that? How is your heart? He said, I believe in Allah and his messenger. I love Allah. Here's a man who's grieving for his mother and his father, but he's worried about cursing the Nabi sallallahu alaihi wasallam more. And our children grow up 2023, 20, 24 right now, 1445, and we believe, you know, it's just a sunnah. You are liberal to take what he said and not what he said. It's whatever you think. You can have an opinion. You know, right now, all of the jama'at, not just one, all of the groups, all of the groups, just to see the su at with the Muslims. Because of social media, this thing about youngsters, ignorant people, be quiet and don't talk. That doesn't even exist anymore. That was a part of your religion, like the companions. It's not just Islam. Not just Islam. Islam, how you think about Allah? How do you look at the Nabi and the prophets? How do you look at the companions? You're cursing the companions? A part of that Islam is, I'm a revert to Islam. I'm, 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 I'm an Ajimi. I'm not even Arab. I don't have knowledge. So why am I giving my opinion? <laughs> now the situation is, everybody gives his opinion about everything and everybody. Before it wasn't like that. It's like your father. You grow up respecting your father, your uncles, the elders are talking. You can talk only if it was allowed. And for you to just talk like that, now don't get me wrong, I don't condone and endorse older people who just don't let younger people talk at all and they have no voice for their marriages, they have no voice. The elders are ignorant in El Islam and youngsters no more. So I'm saying youngsters shouldn't talk, no, nah, I'm not saying that. I'm saying a normal terbiya. You're going to be a father one day or you are a father. How do you feel if your 13, 14 year old son came in and you discussed some serious issues, fit in the masjid, fit in with some family, something's going on, and your 13 year old boy is coming to start talking his opinion? Everybody's going to look at him and you and say, well, You're not teaching your son? But that's how it is now. Anyway, what is in your heart? Ya Ammar. He said, I love Allah and his messenger. You know what the Prophet told him? He told him, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, in Adu Fa'ud. We're in Mecca, hostile environment, Ya Ammar. If these Kuffar Quraysh, if they grab you again in the future, today in the future, because you're weak, if they capture you again 
and they start punishing you again, and they offered you this ultimatum or this, this, this idea, curse me, he said, do it. Do it to save your life. To save your life. And then Allah revealed the ayah of the Quran, the third ayah showing this that we're mentioning today. Mention it today. Anyone who disbelieves after Iman and his heart is open and compelled, his heart is open in shirah, alam nashrah laka sadra, his heart in sharah to kufr. He wanted that. Allah will be angry with him and he'll get a severe punishment. Except the one who disbelieved because he was forced and compelled to disbelieve in this ayah. He's hiding his Islam. He goes to court. They say, all rise. He stands up. They say, you want to swear on the Bible? Man, swear on the Bible, man. If I'm going to swear on the Bible, that's the fourth strike against me. You don't even get four strikes in baseball. He has to think about that. Does he swear? Does he not swear? It's always is a makhraj from all. It's a way out from all of this. If you have knowledge, you know how to navigate. That individual is asked, are you a Muslim? And he doesn't say he's a Muslim. The Prophet said, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, certain things, if we say them, it's a sign of your nifa. So if he claimed he wasn't Muslim because he's afraid, does he go outside of Islam? He doesn't go outside of Islam, depending on his situation. So those are three circumstances, Hwani, that clearly show and indicate. The person finds himself being compelled to do something that he normally wouldn't do it. He normally wouldn't do it. Then the door is open. And look from Allah's mercy when he says, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, in Allah, Tajawaza an Ummati Al Khata Wa Nisyan wa Mastukrihu Alihi. Allah has overlooked and forgiven the people of my Ummah whenever they make a sincere mistake. Whenever they do something out of forgetfulness, and whenever they're compelled to do something haram, Allah forgives them. So he's staying in a hotel room here in Manchester, and he's gharib, musafir, ajnabi. He's not from here. He prays Salatul Asr facing this way. Then his brother came to pick him up. He said, which way is that qibla? The brother told him that way. He doesn't have to make that prayer up again. That's a legitimate mistake. He thought Ramadan began. He thought it ended. It's a legitimate mistake. Allah forgive you for mistakes. And he forgives you for what you forget. So in the month of Ramadan, or if somebody is fasting, and he goes to the meat store to get some meat or to the whatever, and he happens, and he forgets, and he picks up some sweets, and he starts to eat the peanut or whatever. Does that break his fast? That's a question. Doesn't break his fast. The Prophet said, Allah made you eat. So continue your fast. Sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. That's our religion. He said, if an individual forgets to pray, or he, he forgot that he didn't pray, he just forgot. He didn't pray at work. He said, I'm going to pray, inshallah, when I get home. When he got, he got off of work later than he thought, got in the car, it was a traffic jam. He's just thinking how to get home, navigate it. And then he realizes, when he got home, I never prayed Salat al -Asr. Because he forgot. And it's Maghrib time, Isha time. The next day, he just makes that prayer up. Because he forgot. There's a hadith at Khwani about this issue of forgetfulness. It's really important. And that is that when Allah Ta'ala created Adam and he took out of Adam's loins all of his children and placed them at Arafat, 
and cause them to be a witness on themselves. Wa shadu maran fusihim alas to be a bikum kalu bala shahidna in taqulu yomu kiyama inna and hava inna kun and hava rafini. Allah said, Am I not your Lord? They all say, Yeah, you're my Lord. All of them. Allah said, So you won't say yomu kiyama had no knowledge of this. You're on the fitra. And a lot of things happen. One of the things happened is that Adam looked at all of his children and he saw a light from amongst them. It was exceedingly brighter than the others. He said, who was that? He said, that's your son, Dawood. Adam said, how long is he going to live? He's going to live for 60 years. Adam said, I want to give him 40 years of my life. Make it 100. When it was time for Adam's death to come, because as Allah Ta'ala said, Allama Adam asma kullaha, Allah taught Adam everything, the names of everything. Allah gave him information. He doesn't know the animal ghayi. He knows the names of things. He knows when he's going to die. The angel came, Malik al Mot, to take his life. Adam said, hey, I have 40 more years to go. The angel of death said, don't you remember? You gave it to your son, Dawood, that time. Adam said, that never happened. <laughs> he said, that never happened. The prophet said, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, Adam forgot and said something didn't happen, and his children will forget, and they'll say something didn't happen. It's the nature of Benny Adam to forget. He forgot. So our Lord, who created us, knows the nature in which he created us, our father Adam, sallallahu alayhi wa So if somebody is forced and compelled, Religion makes it easy. Last thing I want to mention is really important to bring the balance, inshallah. This is really important. It's like a disclaimer, kind of. I don't want anybody here thinking, because we always have this problem of tu mutshaddit, tu mutsahil. Here's a person over here who believes every lecture, every class, every daura, every khutbah has to be tohi, 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 in that way. Tohi du rububiyah, tohi du asma wa sifat. Tawheed first and foremost. Tawheed last. The prophet of the NB, the Tao of the prophets. Tawheed. Every single day of the whole week. Every lecture. Every khutbah. You say, no, brother. Not like that. Awradaha sa'dun wa sa'dun ishtamin. Ma hakadha ya sa'dun turadun ibn. And if you don't do Tawheed like that, you're not, you're not really not. Come on, brother. The prophets and the messengers, our Nabi, they call it the Tawheed and other issues, and no doubt, Tawheed is the apex and it's the cornerstone, and everything emanates from it. It's the alpha of everything. But every lecture has to be like that. We have brothers like that, unfortunately. You're too, you're too on that side. And then we have the other side. He doesn't want to talk about Tawheed. Even in Masjid al al Hadith and Masjids are people supposed to be on the Sunnah. Masjids that are well known where uh, the thing is, Let's, you know, let's do these talks like Biru Wadi Dain and Sabr and Taqwa, and all that's important. But Tawheed governs this, and Tawheed is the essence of the religion. We got to be balanced in the middle. That's my disclaimer. Don't be a person who's extreme this way or that way. The Prophet sent Mu'adh ibn Ujabal, told him, make the first thing you call them to, and you wahidullah, use the word Tawheed. And if they follow you in that and obey you, tell them they have to pray five times a day. And if they do that, tell them they have to give zakat. Take the money from the agniya and give it to their poor. Other issues going to come. There's a companion who came and he said, yeah, he said, the people, where's Muhammad? He got off his camel, made his camel. He says, where's Muhammad? They said, you see that man over there, the white man with the red man? He went over there. He said, Ya bin Abdul Muttala. Didn't even call him by his name. Old son of Abdul Muttala. I'm going to ask you a series of questions. I'm going to be tough with you. So please don't get angry. The prophet says, Son, my better, let us ask me. The man said, Allahu ladhi arsalaka. Kama arsala min qabl kal anbiya. Did Allah sing you in the same way he sent prophets before you? Our mama said, Allahumma na. The man said, Allahu Amr Kabi Hadha Salat. Did Allah order you to break this prayer? This prayer you told him nothing? He said, Allahumma na. Did Allah tell you that we have to fast in the month of Ramadan? And he put fast before Zakat. He said, Allahumma na. 
did Allah tell you that we have to do zakat? He said, Allah Muhammad not. And then the man said, Ashadu wa la ilaha illallah. Ashadu anna Muhammad abdu Rasulullah. And he said, I am the man. Ibn Thalaba. Like to let the people know. Let the whole world know I'm not a chum. I'm not hiding my Islam. I believe in this. This man. He said, I'm the man, Ibn Thalib. So that everybody will hear. He's not scared of anybody. He's not hiding his Islam from any point of this is. Talked about Tawheed, talked about Zakat and Salah and other issues. وَإِلَىٰ مَدِينَ أَخَافٌ شُعِيبًا قَالَ يَا قَوْمِ اعْبُدُوا اللَّهِ مَا لَكُمْ مِنْ إِلَهٍ غَيْرُهُ وَلَا تَنْقُصُ الْمِكْيَالَ وَالْمِيزَانِ And to the people of Median, we sent their brother Shu'ib, the Nabi, the Rasul, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Shu'ib came and said, oh my people, worship Allah alone. You have no God worthy of worship but him. And don't cheat the people in weights and measures. So the people of Shu'ib, that's what they were doing. They were robbing each other, not giving you your weights. So the Prophet called to Tawheed, and he calls to what the people need as well. Look, called to Tawheed. وَلَقَدْ بَعَثْنَا لِكُلِّ أُمَّةٍ رَسُولًا أَنْ يَعْبُدُ اللَّهِ Loot is from them. But Loot also dealt with homosexuality issue. So in this masjid, in my masjid, that masjid, the masjid that has hikmah and good idara is not the one that's leaning this way or leaning that way. It's the masjid that knows how to put whatever issue needs to be given the most priority which is always tohi. But we have to address other things going on in the community. We have to address our children. I'm not even going to start on our children. Because if you got a kid, like I got a kid, these children are exposed to things that are destroying them. But the point here is being balanced. In this disclaimer, I am not telling anybody to be with the sad kid or to be with the shed, rough and tough. I'm 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 um, I'm forced and you do it now I'm, I'm, I didn't say that. I said if you find yourself in a situation, get people who can help you. One of the companions, Al Barab ibn Azib, and I end with this, the Prophet gave him advice, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. He told that man, La tu should be lahi shay'a wa in kutta or hurikta wala tatruk salat al fa Salat faridatan muta'amida. For men tarakaha muta'amida, bara'at minhu dhimmatullah. He said, do not make shit with Allah, even if they burn you and cut you to pieces. He said, don't make shit. Don't apostate. But what about Ammar, who cursed the Nabi to live another day? This hadith said, don't you make shit, even if you were to get cut into pieces and burned. And don't abandon the wajib prayer for anything, because if you leave off the wajib prayer, you won't be in the protection of Allah, because you left off that prayer. The Prophet was sitting at the Kaaba, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, in Mecca, and he was just marveling at the hurma of the Kaaba in the shade. And one of the weak companions, Khabbab ibn Arat, came and said, Ya Rasulullah, will you not make dua for us? Your dua mustajab. There ain't a lies. Afala tadu lana, afala tastan surulana, ask Allah to help us. Rasulullah sat up and he told him, Abdullah ibn Mas'ud, Ammar, those weak Muslims in the beginning, they used to have to hide in Darul Arqam. To give da'wah and to learn and to talk, how to fraternalize, to learn their religion. They have to go in the nighttime and sneak and learn their religion. And Abu Dhar was tough. He said, I'm going to go out and announce my son. He went out and said, Shadu Allah, they beat him up at the Kaaba, beat him to a pulp. He ran and escaped and went down to the Zamzam water. And he stayed there for one month, hiding. Muslims didn't know where he was at. They didn't have access to the Zemzem. They wanted to bargain. After one month, he came out and he gained weight. When the prophet saw him, he said, where you been? He 
He said, they beat me up. I went to the water Zem Zem. He said, what were you eating there? He said, I was just drinking the water Zem Zem. He said, Ma U Zem Zem, the water of Zem Zem is for whatever you drink it for. It will nourish you and it will fill you up from that example. But that was their condition. So that hadith that says, and so the prophet told him at the Kaaba, there used to be a man with the people who were before you. He would be brought forth by the enemies of Islam. A hole would be dug. He would put in that hole. They would cut him in half with a saw and separate his meat, his flesh, and everything from his bones and his veins. And that would not cause him to leave his religion. He said, the day is coming. This is Mecca where the people from this ummah, a man will set off from Sana'a all the way to Hadramaut. He'll travel that long distance and he won't be afraid of anybody but Allah and the wolf eating his goats. That level of emin and security was coming and he told them that. And he was encouraging them, be patient. Don't leave your religion. Don't leave your religion if you get cut up or you get burned. Because the man before you, that was his patience. So we understand from that one hadith, Ammar, curse me. The other hadith, don't we, it shows there's a middle. You have to know how to stand up to be burnt and cut to pieces. You have to know how not to take that road. Which one is in your best interest? And that comes with learning the religion. So this is what we want to present to you, brothers in a way of um, advice, learn the deen, learn our religion, not on that medhat way, unless you have a bona fide qualified person from the medhat to teach you, and whenever he comes to what the medhat is wrong about, he puts his hands up, this is wrong, and he tells you why. But other than that, get the fiqh of the kitab of Allah and the sunnah of the Prophet, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. If you brothers have any questions, you can put your questions forward, inshallah. Hmm. I mean, if you can buy it, come on. I mean, if you can buy it, come on. I mean, if you can buy it, come Maybe controversial, but inshallah, that in this masjid, there is somewhat gain from these kind of questions, inshallah. So, if that's okay with the Sheikh. Um, so, first question is Did genuine Salafism or the genuine Salafi movement cause a rupture or cause a major rupture? Hmm? What's the question? <laughs> Did the Salafi movement cause it? Major rupture, yeah, and he caused a major rupture to the Dawa, caused a major rupture between the Muslims, caused a major rupture to the Muslim society, and he caused problems, rupture, uh, disunity, etc. So this is based on recent talks mm -hmm. from other Dawa. I mean, since the question is open ended, it's a wide open question, I'll answer it relative to my experience in 1986 when I became Muslim, and I didn't know anything about the Tao at all. I met some people who were giving Tao to the Sunnah, but they were not very aggressive with it. They were what we call immigrants from Lebanon. And although they did a lot of good work that was able to be appreciated, looking back retrospectively, they weren't aggressive enough. They weren't aggressive enough. And I believe they were blameworthy for that. But when reverts started taking that dawah, and when brothers were born in Islam, were not always practicing, they came back to their religion. When the Salafi brothers got the dawah, they started to become more prolific, more active, and the dawah started spreading like wildfire. Did it cause a rupture? I think it depends on what the person's um, definition of a rupture is. I think that uh, um, some places, there was a rupture in some places, not so much. Over in, the, in Africa, I saw it was very difficult in places like Egypt, Sudan, Algeria, places like that, uh, where Sufism and Khurafat was the norm, and Salafia came. It was a rupture. 
because you got ignorance being confronted with nur and light. And the natural result of that is what happened in Mecca. There's going to be a clash of ideas. So is that a rupture? Well, it's what happened with the prophets and the messengers. Salawatullahi Allah wa sallam. The prophets would come with the dawah, and the people said, this is not what our fathers were doing. We were fighting against the prophets and messengers. So I guess in that respect, it was a rupture. But for the African-American community, who are very thirsty for the knowledge of al-Islam and the Sunnah, going through the thing we went through, it's real messed up, Nation of Islam, and then they became real Muslims, and they were real ignorant. And then when we heard people talk about the Sunnah, we accepted it very easily. There was no rupture, because Islam was new to us already. And you still have people from the African-American community who wanted to be on what they were upon, but for the most part, doubt Salafia took over the, um, not took over in an aggressive way, took over in iqtina, where people were convinced. There's another issue I would like to bring to the table here as well, is that we don't run from things like that. LGBT and standing up for the truth is going to cause a rupture. What are we going to do? Try to smooth into this issue? There was no smoothing into this issue. Those people got power. They have reached the upper echelons of, you know, running the, the world. What we think, we're we just going to sl slip into this and slide into it's going to go away? So this thing that happened with the Muslims when the battle of Badr happened is really important, is that the companions were promised you're going to get one of the two victories. You're going to get one of two things. And Allah Ta'ala described what they wanted. They wanted the that the ghayra shawkitin and takuna lakum. You wanted the easy thing to be for you. You go and you defeat them and you get the money without fighting. But Elijah just wanted something else. And that was you would fight and you would kill them, they would kill you, you would be killed, so forth and so on. But naturally, the companions, love the Allah, they wanted, to, <laughs> you don't want no confrontation. That's Benny Adam. That's his nature. So I think, generally speaking, rupture, that's a big word. Some places, there are ruptures that I know about. There was a lot of fighting. It was usually because there was a strong Sufi uh, stronghold there. And as a result of that, they were not giving up and allowing any room for the dollar to expand. But despite them, husband I know is still um, a spread. Last thing I want to mention concerning that is it is from hikmah to make decisions to get the honey from the bee without getting stung. This is our religion. That's hikmah. Putting things in a proper place. Being rough, tough, well, that's the best thing. Being quiet, and that's the best thing. Being soft and gentle. I'm married. Some of you are married. I can go and be an alpha male and talk to my wife and my children any way that I want to. But if I want to get the most traction and the best results from them, the, the, the best thing to do is to have good skills. That's why Muawiyah ibn Abi Sufyan, Radhi Allah, and he said, he was the leader of the Muslims in the Sham, Lowell Kamet, Baini wa Baini, and Nas, Sha'at Wahida, Man Lamman Qata'at. If there existed between me, I'm the governor. I'm in control of the people. If there only consisted between me and them, a strand of hair, he said, well, lie there, he would never break. When they let it loose, then I'll pull. When they pull, I let it loose. Meaning you have to have some ability to manage and to deal with people like the Imam here, the admin here. You rough and tough, it's going to be a problem. And I end with that. If you were rough and tough with them, Muhammad, they would have left you and dispersed. Nobody wants anybody dealing with them nasty. Your wife, your children. It was a rahma. If you were rough and tough, they would have left you. If you were hard hearted and so forth and so on. Analyze Adam and Adam. Um, secondly, uh, your advice to dua to are getting, if I may say, too big for their boots. Yeah, so your advice to dua who are getting too big for their boots uh, due to the amount of followers they have on social media, due to their shahadat certificates that they have received, 
or due to, for example, studying philosophy, they think they know better and are bigger than scholars and start to criticize them. Maybe you can add that to the next question, which is uh, your advice to do art again and influencers that are attacking Salafis and Saudi ulama, uh, uh, apparently just to get more support and more followers and Jews. <laughs> the um, blood of the ulama of Islam, as everyone knows, is poison. They're not like the normal people in our religion. They occupy a special place in our religion. Allah has raised in degrees those who believe from Mungshu and those who have been given knowledge on levels. They're different levels. He asks a rhetorical question that doesn't need to be answered. Only. Ask them, say, are they equal? I mean, those who know and those who don't know. Those who don't know are not like those who know. And the scholars in this issue are those who know. That tremendous ayat that describes our religion in the Quran, where Allah Ta'ala talks about the ulama, وَالْرَاسِخُونَ فِي الْعِلْمِ يَقُولُونَ آمَنَّ بِهِ كُلُّ مِنْ إِنْدِ رَبِّنَا the Rasi Khun, those who have knowledge, what came before the ayah, before this part of the ayah, is those, those people, Alladina Fiqulu Bihim Zaywun Fiyatabi Una Mata Shaba Minu Tira Ibtira al Fitna wa Tira Tawili Wala Yana Mu Tawilu illallah. Stop. So there are people during our time who have diseases in their hearts and they follow the mutashabihan, the ambiguous issues, they, they follow their desires. Why like we hear a lot of nonsense from some of the um, dua influencers who are saying crazy things today, trying to confuse people. Yeah, juju, my juju, this is that, it's not that, we don't believe it, and all of this stuff. The ayah of the Quran said, that Allah knows the reality of what's going on and those who are endowed with knowledge. The ones who have knowledge, not every armor weapon is in from the people. So, scholars in Islam, Ikhwani, are not like regular people. And we shouldn't talk bad about them. We can disagree with them, but we should always hold them in honor. Let me tell you something. I'll give you this example. Where we come from in our villages and our towns where we come from, if someone ran into your house back where we come from, and they say, hey, your son, your brother, your cousin, he was over there in the street, and he pushed scholar, a real scholar, a mufti. Not someone who graduated from Medina, Umar Qura. No, real scholar, with your fatwa, scholar. He pushed him down and spat on him. He fought him and punched him. Our family are going to look at that action as being way up there, like the relative being caught in public drunk. That's very embarrassing. The relative had a baby, had a wet lot, boy or girl. That's really bad. To push, punch, harm, spit on a scholar like that in our religion, to this day, for the most part, where we come from, people are going to look, what, what's wrong with you? Of course, that's all we're not. But now I'm here with the social media and all of this stuff, Followers, views, everyone has an opinion. Now scholars have spoken bad about. So I would warn against that and say to a person, run away from the person you see doing that the same way with the more. You will run away from the lion. Because if a lion came in here, I've seen lions in real life, and they're not as cute as they look on TV. That lion will eat you, man, in one. So some of you, if the lion came in, you would be inquisitive. Some of you, because you saw my TV, and you go and say, well, look at this Nick, y'all. You want the brothers to be here? I know you can't do that with that line. I'm going to jump out of that window as soon as I see them walking in here. If anybody get in my way, even a little brother, I'm running through the person because I want to live to see another day. Run away from the people who talk about scholars like that, the way you would run away from that line. Because the line will just eat you up, you're dead. And you shout out, you're shahada. But the person who talks bad about the scholars, you're going to lose your religion. And that's what the scholars of the Sunni used to say. Like Imam Abdullah Mubarak used to mention 
رحمة الله عليه من استخف بإخوانه ذهبت مرؤته Anyone who doesn't, he minimizes the feelings of his brothers and his, he doesn't care. You promise him, you break the promise, you lie on him, you always start in trouble. You will lose that friendship. They will not, they'll look at you because you're not paying attention. You're going to lose that thing of respect. And let me say, Whoever looks at the leaders like that, talk bad about them, you're not scared of them, you just be doing it, you're going to lose your dunya. They're going to cut your head off, put you in prison. And then the last thing is the point. He said, Women is the khafa bin ulama, dahaba dinu. The one who doesn't, who, who, who looks down on scholars, is religion. He's not going to have a religion. Last thing about this question, I have to say this because I don't want, I don't like this thing. When Sadafia came to my people, it was the best thing that ever happened after Islam. But when the infighting and the bickering happened, the Sadafi brothers, my people were African-American, the Sadafi community was destroyed by irresponsible people who were given fatwas and also by irresponsible behavior of some of the brothers who were just weaponizing the religion. How do you weaponize the religion? I'm a father. My wife and I are always telling our children the position of the father and the mother. So you got to listen to me. I'm going to marry you to whoever I want I blackmail her. She doesn't have to listen to me. I, should, I shouldn't marry her and force her to be married. She doesn't want to get, so I blackmail her. Religion gave the husband a high position. The prophet said if I would order someone to make subject to someone else, I would order the woman to make subject to the man. But that's only for Allah. So I say that to my wife, to weaponize, make her subject her under me. We shouldn't weaponize the Dao. And that's what brothers do today. Dao is not for Allah. It's for your sheikh, for your melhat. So we don't want to weaponize it. So I have to say this. The brother said that Saudi Arabia, that they talk bad about the scholars of Saudi Arabia. Maybe this is a situation the specific, you know, I think it is. But I want to say Saudi Arabia are not the only scholars in Islam. I'm against that understanding. Though he is not only in Saudi Arabia. Ulema is not only Saudi Arabia. Salafi is not synonymous with Saudi Arabia. There are ulema in Pakistan. There are ulema in Africa. There are ulema in America and here. Ulema of the Quran. People who know the Quran and they already learned that science, or they learned the Arabic language, so so on. So I don't want to be a part of furthering that misconception that some people have, where we politicize and weaponize everything Saudi Arabia. I don't believe in that. Me, I don't believe in that. That shouldn't be conflated and misunderstood to mean I'm against Saudi Arabia. No. A Salafia is pure Islam. There's nothing known as Salafi of Bahrain, Salafi of Kuwait, Salafi of Afta. It's Islam. It's Islam. That's it. So we shouldn't talk bad and have bad opinions about any ulama anyway. We shouldn't make khuruj against any of the hukam. We can't make it haram for others and halal for others. So I want to make that point. And Allah is best. The fuck they are, I think. Uh, the next question, inshallah, um, advice to those du'at who claim to make peace and unity on the front, the zahir apparently, but then behind closed doors, behind the hijab, uh, they have toxic criticism for other movements, for the Ahlul Hadith, such that they create uh, animosity between the normal brothers and ourselves, such that people don't give us salam, don't eat our food, and don't even pray with us, and so on. Now, one of the worst characteristics in Ellis Land is to be the person the Prophet calls on the law and said to him, Guru Wachain, Alev Yati Ila Ha'ulai Bi Wachain, Wayati Ila Ha'ulai Bi Wachain. One has two faces. He comes to this group of people with one face, goes to that group of people with another face. Just quick to the point, one of the things that I witnessed and I noticed, and people got to be careful of this, I know some duas of the Sunnah who are trying to be balanced and trying to have hikmah. Because sometimes that hikmah is not hikmah. 
It's a chida. It's treachery. Not their fault that it's not aware. Because I found the people who say, hey, happy wise, let's take it easy with everybody. They will be patient with every group and every idea, except for the people of the Sunnah. They have the least amount of patience with the people of the Sunnah. And even myself, I have to make jihad. I have to make jihad with nafs. Sarah, I gotta tell you. I gotta make jihad against my own nafs. Because I saw how the rough, tough, Sedefi brothers jammed up a lot of stuff. I saw it, I experienced. My own community, African Americans, there's no joke, real situation. Fit in a fold in the whole world, wherever you go. Wherever you go. And I don't like that. But I can't be like the people who all I do is criticize those people. I want those hardcore brothers to be more gentle with other people. So why I'm not more gentle with them then? I have to be gentle with them as well and not dislike them more than not like that so that's been my experience that these people were calling let's uh, put our hands together and the spokes on the wheel they all go to the cinder and let's sing songs and everything and let's sign contracts not to refute each other and let us you know cooperate on what we agree on and you know what we disagree let's just look over that i found those people are the um, least patient people when it comes to why don't you be easy with people that soon very critical of it. So I believe if that leaves and proves anything, it proves it's a dollar that's bought here. It's cat on fly. Um advice to some of the massages that um they call people mashayikh um like yourself, alhamdulillah, or some other mashayikh uh, who are Salafi, they stand for Ahlul Hadith, they stand for the Hadith school, they stand for the Salafi school, but eventually after using them, maybe gaining a following, maybe getting more people into the masjid, after that they decide to kind of um, get rid of them basically. Uh, du'at to these masajid are just using du'at. You are young, you speak English, come. You are Salafi, you have a following, come. After they they are done with them, class, we don't need you anymore. And just uh, general advice to these massages and institutes that have this bad attitude to our device in that foundation. Can I ask middle course if uh, um, we would be brutally honest, the goal the objective should be a dawa in Allah and not dawa to organizations or dawa to ourselves, to our medhat, to our sheikh. So institutions that are really on the Sunnah and people really on the Sunnah, you have to be very careful about being used in a way where people can make a talab and play games with you because that happens. I was invited in London to go to a program with, um, I think it's called MRDF, something like that. Is that the thing? Yes. And I knew why they were invited. It was a big program in a hotel, and I knew they wanted me to bring people who would listen to me. I said, sure, I'll go. But in the condition, I talk first, so I talk last. And I had about seven students with me. So if I talk last, we'll listen to all of the talks, and anything I think should be mentioned, when my turn comes on, I'll mention it. And what I believe is wisdom, easy, and like that. But if I go first, I'm the first one. So when I, they chose me to go first. So I didn't do a generic talk, generic, bitter, why name, the importance of sabr, the importance of the birth of the rain. Those are generic, all of them important. All of them important. But the talk had to be clear, the importance of having fundamentals in your religion. That's what the talk was. And it was about what Islam really is and looks like. Not something generic, where you may inspire people but after you inspire them, they're going to listen to other people when they say all kinds of stuff, which they did. One of the things that was said by the person who was introducing me, and I was first, he was talking to the crown, a woman of the crown, and when he gave the definition of la ilaha illallah, he said, la ilaha illallah meant there is no strength except Allah's strength, no power, that was part. So I heard that, that was all I heard. 
So in my talk, I had to inculcate that in the talk of the importance of fundamentals and principles, meaning what is the Tao to set it here? That was the talk, not generic. We explained to them, Latin Dahawa doesn't mean that. It means there's no God worthy worship on the of Jeff. So this issue that Juan has is balance. If we don't take advantage of places when given an opportunity and people give you a chance, don't put conditions on you, you have to acknowledge the way the situation. Are they going to play games with you? They're going to play, you know, change your words around? You're being there. They're going to give you, you're going to talk about a, 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 a topic that's generic so that when people are there, they know no difference between you and the next people who came after you in the Dow and the talk today. Why go? Don't go. But if you have an opportunity to go anywhere, to give Dow a lot, and you get that message to the creation, and that's something that is, Highly recommend it. But we have to know today that uh, there are a lot of people playing games. So this whole um, environment of uh, um, where and what platforms to go, we have to be careful. It requires some fit and cooperation between two eyes. So that we don't appear as if we're sending mixed messages and we're against each other. Copy the Are there any students from any questions from the floor, inshallah? Um, Shekhna, with, um, with regard to some of the du'at, um, you may have touched on this slightly, but a bit more specific. What do you think of the stance of being a da'i but not taking a position? For example, what is your aqidah? I'm not telling you. <laughs> what is your aqidah? I'm not going to tell you. What benefit is that for you? What do you think about this position and what is your advice to the du'at? <laughs> a Muslim has a lot of characteristics. They said to the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, one man said, Ya Rasulullah, call me fit Islam. Tell me something that no one else can say. He said, Qul amin tu billahi thumastabin. Say I believe in Allah and then be upright. So once Prophet Muhammad said he believed, he walked the walk, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Everybody else, we say, a lot of what we don't do. And that's a bad character, quality. Like the Rasul of the Quran said, Ma uridu an ukhalifakum ilama and haqman. I don't want to tell you don't do this and I do it myself. Ya ayyu nadina amin, lima tukuru, ma la tukuru. Why do you say what you don't say, what you don't do? It's a bad thing. So one of the characteristics of Islam and the Muslim is, Clarity, man. You have to be clear. You can't be with that old way changing colors to please people. How do we know that? Too many proofs of that. Allah just mentioned in the Quran, "Yahlika min halaka and bayina tan, wa yahya min hayya and bayina." The yat, walakin yat the Allah amra kana mafula. The yahlika min halaka and bayina tan. So that Allah is going to make an affair come into existence and manifest it, he's going to do that. So that the one who's destroyed will be destroyed with clarity. No doubt why he was destroyed. It was clear. And the one who was saved and successful, he'll be saved and successful in clarity. Allah described the problems and the messages of the religion that he sent to him. لِكُلِّنْ جَعَلْنَا مِنْكُمْ شِرْعَةً وَمِنْ That's what Allah said. We sent every Nabi and Rasul a Sharia legislation, halal, haram, eat this, don't eat that way, so on, and a minhaj. What's a minhaj? A tariqah wadiha. The clear path that he's traveling. No ambiguity. Prophet told his companions in this Ummah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, inni taraktukum ala al-muhajjat al-bayba, layluha kallahariha, la yazigu anha ila alif. I left few people on a religion and muhajjit al It's nighttime, it's like it's day, it's clear. There's no ambiguity in the religion of Al Islam. So the Muslim is a person who is supposed to be upright and clear. So, on the other hand, the one who's playing games, he changes colors like a chameleon. 
to fit into the environment. And this is something that is plain worthy. This is the action of the Fak, the people of uh, hypocrisy, and the people of the Zayka. May that help us. And clarity, Akhwani, doesn't mean being rough and tough and nasty. Clarity doesn't mean talk to people in a condescending way. Clarity is when you give a lecture somewhere, a chutzpah somewhere, people know what you're talking about. They know exactly where you're coming from. They don't get you mixed up and you're calling your dawah. They don't get it mixed up with other calls and other dawah. It's very clear what you're saying. And sometimes you don't even have to use some of the buzzwords. Like and the sunnah said if you don't even have to use those words. The people know. Said if you not said But we're living in a time where the situation requires a lot of um, a lot of um, wisdom though and perseverance. Because we have the opposite of that hadith. Uh with that to not feel. Give glad tidings and don't run people away. We run a lot of people away unnecessarily. But there's still people who shout out lots, giving them to appeal. <clears throat> and clarity is part of what everyone needs. Well, no, I mean. <laughs> yes, brother, do you have a question? Sure. Yeah. Yeah. Why uh, do youth um, fall into atheism nowadays? Uh, they're prone to fall into atheism more so in these days. Just so I can, uh, the sisters get a question. So the brother's question was, why do people, Muslims, are falling into atheism nowadays? And why are they more prone to following, uh, following, following into atheism nowadays? Like that I just said, when I can yak the Allahu amra kanam ula, things about the qadr of Allah. And we know as the Prophet mentioned, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, Every year with the passing of the next year is getting worse and worse and worse into Yom Al-Qiyam. So we're living in the worst time moment of many Adam. It's a tough time to be a teenager right now. It's a tough time to be unmarried right now. It's a tough time to be divorced right now. It's a tough time to be a Muslim right now. It's the worst time. It's going to get progressively worse and worse and with the passing of each year, the soil was being prepared for the Dajjal to come out. Where if he came out, you would think if he said, I'm Allah, I'm a rabbu kum ala. You would think everyone in this message would say, get out of here, man. You're crazy, you're drunk. But when he comes out, the people who hear that are going to consider what he's saying. Even from the Muslims. So why is atheist spreading atheism? Prophet says, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, Yadrusu Islam, Tama Yadrusu Washifoba, Hatta la Yudra, Masara, Wala Zaka, Wala Sun, Wala Nusu, Wa Yusra, Ala Kitabi Lai Ta'ala Fi Laylatin Wahidatin Hatta la Tapta Fi Aya. He said, Al Islam is going to fade away the way a new foe fades away. It'll go lighter and lighter and lighter, more rip, more rip until the time comes where people won't even know, the Muslims, what is Salah, what is Zakat, what is Sun, what is Hajj. And the Quran will be taken up in one night to the point where one ayat won't remain in the earth. When Yom al comes, people won't even say Allah, Allah. So atheism spreading amongst Muslims and other Muslims is sign of the times. Sign of the times. Atheism is spreading because it's a sign of the time. Another issue that's really important is that we ourselves many times are sleeping. Muslims are fighting, too busy fighting one another at the expense of what we're supposed to be doing. This is the best community brought forth for all of the people because you make an amr ma'ruf in nan al munka. But all we do is fight. I don't know if you guys saw those people on the Hanafi channel. All they do is refute Salafi, Salafi is refute themselves. Everybody is refuting each other. This is what we're doing. So does that mean we should all be quiet? No, we have to make the truth known. But Allah Ta'ala has commanded us. Let there be a group of you who are going to come forward and call to Al Islam al Khayr. So we've been lynching on that ground, on that, on, on that, on, on that, uh, 
in that regard. So many reasons, man. You got these people in uh, democracy. It encourages atheism. It encourages it. These people have me fucked. They claim that they believe in Islam, but I believe they believe in Allah, Jesus, and Kevin. It's just a call. It's just something they say. It's just Kalam he's saying. And just as we are going to follow the Jews and the Christians and everything that they've done, we have those people who say we believe in Allah, but they're also liberal. The teacher, the sheikh himself, the teacher, he can't even say the truth. He's scared. We have a wedding. One of us has a wedding. I'm going to go to the wedding. We, and instead of being my hukuma, I'm going to have this wedding in this masjid or whatever. It's a Muslim, it's kuffar, I don't have anything to do with it. But the ma vast majority of the women won't wear hijab. No one's forcing them not to wear hijab. There's ikhtila at the tables. Five men, six women, six women, six, five men like that. Music. The lady is walking down with a wedding gown that's white. You can see through it. And they're throwing rice on her. And the organ is playing here. It comes the bride all dressed in white and stuff like that. Everything is a kuffar do. And I can't decide, should I go, should I not go? We're supposed to be people who are Muslims. Islam is supposed to govern that wedding, the walima, what we're doing. So all of those things open up the door for an ilhad. And from an ilhad is atheism. <laughs> hey, let me tell you something else, something that happened in Hajj. Sister was 32 years old. She grew up around Kufar. She went to Catholic school private school. Like some of our kids go to public school. So every day in Catholic school she has to say, Hail Mary, full of grace, blessed is thou from amongst women, whatever the Catholic people say. And you do this stuff. The mother and the father let her just do it. They didn't stay on top of her. 32 years old she come back to her religion. She's trying to cry. She go to Hajj this year. Didn't know at Hajj, at a certain time of the month, a woman is not supposed to pray. You would think that's Everybody knows that. Bedouin, New River, she didn't know. She honestly didn't know why. Because her parents didn't teach her. She didn't grow up in the environment, learning religion. So if someone came to her and it was the right circumstances, why wouldn't she be an atheist? Muslim women are married for farming. The people ask me all the way back, all the way back in February, which you are around. Um, Please do our daughter's um, wedding. Sure, I'll do it. Where's the wali, the father? Where the witnesses? Fulan and Fulan. What's the dowry? What's the dowry? I don't know the girl. I got to ask her. Are you being forced? No, I'm not. Everything is there. It is now August. You asked in February. Come at the day of the Nikah. The guy who's getting married is a white person. They say, He's going to accept Islam today. He's going to accept Islam today. You asked me to do the wedding in February. You mean to tell me you wait until the day of the wedding to give him Islam? If he accepted El Islam right then, could I marry him? That's my question to you guys. He accepted Islam. I gave him the Shahada. Can I marry him to that Muslim girl? Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. You think so? Yeah. What do you guys think? I can marry him because he's a, he becomes a Muslim. But I refuse to marry him. And there's a surah in the Quran called Surah Al-Mumta'ina, where you test the women to see if they're really Muslims when they come and make, you gotta test them. You just don't, just like that Romanian. I'm not against Romanians. I have a nice Romanian late neighbor. But the Romanian comes to you with a hijab and a lady with fi sabilina, fi sabilina. It's Ramadan. Mm. I'm not going to speak to a nasty, but I say, okay, you're Muslim, you're Muslim. Give me three names of the prophet's wives. I don't speak English, brother. Mm. But you were communicating with me a few minutes ago. So I test her to see if I'm going to give her the money. She should know two names of the wives of the prophet, one name. You're just faking. You're not a real Muslim. Surah al-Muntahina. That's what Allah told us to do. If they, if they come to you, uh, test them. So I didn't marry them because I know what kind of marriage that is. That's the marriage where he's going to remain. This lady was professional, husband professional, from where we come from. 
They made it. And this was their daughter's situation. I said, I'm not marrying them. And don't say why am I Shadid? You are Shadid and that you're trying to break your daughter's Islam. I'm trying to say you're Shadid and that you're doing everything to destroy her, make her become an atheist or something like that. So my issue with the and I just have to say this, why is it that people are trying to practice, they always have to LGBT, shoving it down our throats. I have to always be apologetic. When I go for the job and I don't shake hands, I have to say, sorry, no offense. I got to apologize. I'm tired of apologizing. And that's what Allah told us in the Quran. Don't be sad. Don't be weak. When you people have the upper hand, if you truly believe, that doesn't mean be nasty and disrespectful to people, but why do we always have to be on the back foot, on defense, all the time? Never want to be on a team, we always got to play defense. No sport, you want to play defense all the time. They even say the best defense is a good offense, but they're not a defense. So some of this issue is, is a serious issue. You think that, hey, you know these um, text messages? Someone will see you a text message, he says, make do out for me. I'm going to take an exam. My wife's going to have a baby. And they'll see you a text message with the hands like this. Is this how we make do out? Muslims, we make do out like this? Christians, they make do out. People in the Orient, China, Japan, they do that out of respect. How do we make do out? Like this, like that, like this, like that, like that. But we'll send this thing like that. Because it's the popular culture that we live in. And this stuff supports atheism and kufr and all this stuff. That's why we have to make jihad. And those of you who are not married, you gotta get a good mujahideen lady, good mujahida. She's gonna help you, not fight you. Don't get the Bollywood wife, get the mujahida. Knowledge, student, not all that stuff. Good at it. That's like I'm sure. I was just having a, a discussion with the brother recently in relation to uh, the concept of al-wala, al-bara. And now his concern was that, you know, he believes uh, from what he's read is that the Salafi Aqidah says that we should hate the kuffar, we should hate disbelievers. And I said to him, look, listen, end of the day, we hate the actions of the disbelievers, but we don't hate the people per se. Like, for example, if, you know, if your mother's a disbeliever, do you hate her? No, you don't hate her. So... What would you say to a person like that? We hate what Allah Ta'ala hates. And we love what Allah loves. That's what the Prophet said. Sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Man ahabba lillah. Wa abghada lillah. Faqad istak mana iman. Oh, when you love Allah, he's Allah. His iman is complete. So Allah Ta'ala hates the actions of people. If an individual who has a relative, it's from the fitra, man. To love your relative. Especially if they're distant people. Rasulullah is the example. And Allah mentioned about him in the Quran, إِنَّكَ لَا تَهْدِي مَنْ أَحْبَبْتَ وَلَا إِنَّ اللَّهِ يَهْدِي مَنْ يَشَاءَ Ya Muhammad, you do not die those who you love. That's an ayah of the Quran. The ayah said, فَلَعَلَّكَ بَاخُ النَّفْسَةَ عَلَىٰ أَنْ لَا يُؤْمِنُ بِهَذَا الْحَدِيثِ أَسَفَا It may be, Ya Muhammad, that you will worry yourself to death till you die. Because you're so worried they're not taking this religion. He cared about those people. He loved his mother and his father. Let him love his mother and his father. But you don't love the kufr. You can't love the action. And that's what Allah told us to do in the Quran. <laughs> and Allah didn't Allah doesn't make it haram for you. He doesn't prohibit you to deal justly and kindly and fairly to those who don't fight you for your deen and they don't expel you from your homes. To be good with them. And Allah loves those who are fair and just. So the one who's a criminal, the one who's fighting, that's right. We're going to hate him and his actions. We're going to light him up. We're going to raise the flag to deal with him. Because he's doing what deserves that. But the one who's being gentle and kind and respectful and they're respectful to them as well, right? And a lot of times, that's the justice of Islam, Akhi. And lastly, we have that ayat of the Quran where Allah shows this clearly, man, the justice of love and hate in Islam for Muslims, towards non-Muslims. 
لتجدن أشد الناس أداوة للذين آمنوا اليهود والذين أشركوا You'll find those people who have the most enmity, hatred, animosity to the Muslims, those who are Jews and the Mushrikeen, because Tawheed, Mushrikeen against that. The Jews have hasid that Rasulullah came up, but Allah praised the Christians in the Quran that they have leaders, um, priests, who eyes cry when they make the dhikr of Allah. All of them? No, but that justice is there. So we hate the actions, man. You can hate the action without hating the person. But you can also hate the person. Some of these kufar, we hate them. We don't just hate their actions. We hate them. Like for own. That when I was telling you guys when I became a Muslim African-American, a lot of African-American Muslims were saying, you know, tell the black people, hey, brother, what's up, brother? It's not a Muslim. Hey, brother, hey, sister. Hey, brother, hey, sister. Come on down to the mosque, brother, sister, Friday. We're going to have doubt. And they would say, Fred Allen is our brother. But what those black people did in Egypt, they built them pyramids. We had great civilization. We say, no. Fred Allen is not our brother. Fred Allen is the Adu of Allah. Those who were with Musa, the Yahoo, who believe, are our brothers. Fred Allen, like they're not our brother. So we can hate the action, I can hate the um, people if they deserve them. And Allah knows the best. <coughs> yeah, it could be the mid last one if you want. Um, last question, inshallah. Um, Shekhana, what do you think, um, or what is your advice to some of the institutions and in the society? Uh, sometimes you know, I allow other movements into the massage because I think maybe they would fill in a gap that they aren't filling. For example, some groups may come in and say, we, we are the Salihin, do what is agreeing, uh, uh, something that is agreeable to us. But then when they take the youth away, whether it's for three days, 40 days, or four months, all of a sudden then when they take them away to their massage, the other half of the world, or the side of the country, or the side of the uh, city, then they'll bring out al-ahadith uh, and al amal and uh, you know, basically the people start, starts to fly kind of stories. You know, that's why knowledge is really important. Again, if you have knowledge, you know how to deal with things. When the Prophet sent Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam Mu'ad ibn Jabal to him, and he did not send an ignorant person. Mu'ad ibn Jabal has some khasatis, special qualities. You know, Mu'ad when he's raised up, he's going to be holding a flag. And behind him will be all of the Renama came after him. He was one of the four people that the Prophet said to the companions, he said, Abu Bakr, Muhammad, man, I and the rest of them, is stuck with the Quran in Arba. Learn the Quran from four of my companions. One of them was Mu'adh ibn Jabal. Now, ignorant. He's from the ulama of the ulama of the companions. The Prophet sent him to get down. He didn't send ignorant people. He became a Muslim with those African Americans. I can stay with them. I found brothers who go to messages and they visit messages. I went with them because I'm trying to win a religion. After one day of sleeping there, the next day they told me just to get up and talk. I said, well, what am I say? They said, let's come to you. What do you mean? I'm a new Muslim. What's going to come to me? And they encouraged me to talk. And then as I spent a little bit of time, it became quite apparent this is not the right way. So the people who talk and get down with people in our religion know what they're talking about. So I have a rule concerning this issue. I don't let other groups in the mystery where I'm meeting man or have something to do with that. Don't let it happen. I don't let it happen. As the Quran said, what's after the truth except what's wrong, false. So everybody's entitled to come to the masjid and to worship Allah as Majelli and the freedom to do that, but I have a manna, and a manna that what the Muslims are exposed to, and I'm helping to expose them to that, has to be right. It can't be based upon feelings and emotions, it's like, in which you, no, it has to be right. So, where did I go? I was in Liverpool, we had a nice masjid, and in that masjid, every group was in there, these groups. I'm against all these groups, all of them. 
And I'm a group, group, I'm a bit against group of Sedefi brothers, call them Sedefi. Ain't got to be with the group. No. Beyond Sedefi. Yeah. The way the companions understood the religion, what was the religion, that's what we want to be now. But anyway, point is, when I got there, that group, uh, one of those groups, they were already all of the groups, but that was the one group that could talk. I said, look, I'm going to be, man, we're going gonna, gonna to stop this. I'm going to have a, a civilized discussion as to why I'm stopping it all. And I tried my best to be civilized, but they were very emotional. And it's again, like I said earlier, everybody is willing to be patient with everybody else, except to be patient with the person that assumed that. They were not patient, they were nice. And from those six points, is the brother, they didn't show me any love. They showed me no love. But I'm not trying to be an enemy to anyone, but the Ayatollahs with the Alam, who I have been with Taqwa. Well, I had to honor them. I had to listen to what was mine. So, going to places, I say, let's go to places. After judging it, no conditions, let's talk together, weighing the benefits, we go. But people come into, no. No. No one should have access to the Nimba of the people of the Sunnah and to the microphone and to the platform of the people of the Sunnah except the Dao to the Sunnah. When I kill him, no bite in my tongue, anything. But that's a double standard. Yeah, I have double standard sometimes. Do I say I am a um, minority in America? African American, I'm a Muslim, I'm a minority. LGBT, they're minorities as well. So now, I can't have double standards. I don't want you to treat me with racism as a minority, so therefore I can't treat those people I gotta have open. I said, nah. I have double standards. I'm not treating them like that. And I want my rights. Because me asking you for my rights is something natural. This stuff is not natural, according to the religion that I have. So I don't use that twisted understanding. Because I don't want you to be racist towards me. I don't want you to, you know, treat me bad. So now I have to push for the rights of a group that my religion is saying this is an abomination. Well, when you're mutalowin, mutalowin, you change colors, this is the fic that we come up with. This, this, this crazy fic of accommodation and liberalism. And before you know it, we're not practicing Islam anymore. And why do we have to apologize? And did you guys see, and I'm dumb here, there's a white brother, I forgot his name, he was on his social media and they were asking him, he had a bald head. They were asking him, um, do you feel superior in your religion? Something like that. And the guy was very articulate and calm about why he felt superior as a Muslim. Did you guys see that? Man, don't tell me I'm the only person in this message who saw that now. <laughs> it's real, real well known right now. He's, this guy is becoming real popular. He's like a very educated guy. Oh, what? Yeah, yeah. Yeah. What's his name? I don't know. He was so talking about the, the male patriarchy yeah. Yeah. system. Oh, yeah, he's, he's been talking about a few things. Yeah. Up until this point, I like what that guy's message is. But you know, so many people out there, you gotta be careful. You say something good about him, and then in two weeks, he's saying he could say something crazy. I defended one of the most popular duat in the world today in English. One of the most popular. But then I had to take that defense back. Because I saw he couldn't answer a good question. Being asked serious questions. I defended him because I never saw him going to shit bitter. I never saw him um, I never saw him compromising Tohi. And some brothers started criticizing. I defended him. I said, look, well, if you can show me he's good, if he's going to shit cover. But then I saw he couldn't answer questions. Serious questions. Like what's the truth? What is the truth? Is it this group, that group, this group? And he made a game, he made it laugh. He said, they call me chocolate man. This is not the time to laugh. I'm a community of looking at you right now. And if you can't tell them what Islam is the right one, it's a problem. So when I saw that, I didn't say he was an innovator. I didn't want against him. I said, I don't, I don't we take that thing back. Why? Because he changed. So I don't want to give an endorsement of that other brother. What's his name? Um, Boy, white dude, very articulate. Guy. Very calm brother. 
And how was Trump? Because those brothers who give Dawa like that, if they gave Dawa to pro, pro progressiveness and what Mahami Jai brothers like that, if they just stayed in their lane, give Dawa to that. Don't start coming out and start giving Dawa about other things. I'm living up to Wahhab and bank. Don't don't do that. This is where the folder comes. And a lot of knows best. He's Allah and Allah. We should be grateful for the Sheikh. He sat here for approximately, he's been with us for about two hours. And the, of course, speaking is not easy. And the Sheikh has been traveling as well, and he's had a talk during the day. So we ask Allah to bless the Sheikh, to honor him, to honor his uh, reputation, to keep his. To protect his reputation and his honor for the dunya and for the akhirah, and we ask Allah Subhanahu wa Taala to grant jannah and firdaus and a'la with the prophets and messengers, alayhi salam, salihin, siddiqin, and the shuhada. And we hope the idhnillah Allah Taala we can call him back soon. The idhnillah Taala. And with that, we end this lecture. Barakallahu fiqum wa jazakum Allah khairan. Wa subhanakum wa bihamdika shukran. Hey, did anybody see my mask?